This program contains rare films of World War II originally shot in color, found during a two-year worldwide search. Much of it has never been seen on television before. These films are presented now in high definition. Some images are graphic in nature, and viewer discretion is advised. I motion to everyone, ordering them to lay down a covering fire. In the Pacific, First Sergeant Jack Werner takes charge after his commanding officer is killed during the invasion of Leyte. I was only in command for an hour, but I feel I did reasonably well. At least I didn't get anybody killed. While in Europe, this is beyond what any man should be forced to endure. G.I. Rocky Blunt battles the elements during the Battle of the Bulge. I tried to get out of the hole, and my legs were frozen into a block of ice, almost to the knees. Where does a common faith that man shall know bread and peace, that he shall know justice and righteousness, freedom and security, an equal opportunity and an equal chance to do his best, not only in our own lands, but throughout the world. Ardennes Forest, near the Belgium-German border, almost a quarter of a million German troops, spearheaded by 600 tanks, launch a surprise attack against the American lines. It is Hitler's desperate final offensive, his last chance to change the tide of a losing war. Thinly spread and undersupplied, the Americans are overwhelmed. Within days, the Germans pushed them back almost 40 miles, creating a bulge in the American lines. The Americans must hold the Germans until reinforcements arrive. But with severe winter storms setting in and temperatures dropping to below zero, the situation for the Americans goes from bad to worse. We've been out here for three days and nights. My face is frozen. I can't feel my legs. The longer I remain here, the more I fear I will freeze to death. Nineteen-year-old Boston native Rocky Blunt is enduring the frozen hell of the Ardennes forest. Drafted in 1943, the jazz drummer is attached to the Army's 84th Infantry Division. They're still awaiting a German counterattack. Since the battle in the Ardennes began two weeks ago, the winter weather has incapacitated both combatants, handicapping American air power and constricting the mobility of the German assault force. temperatures are well below freezing, and the cold is claiming lives and limbs.
This is beyond what any man should be forced to endure. If I wasn't already frozen to death, I'd let myself wonder when this will end. I don't want to close my eyes, but I have no choice. I'm too exhausted. When I open my eyes, it might be morning. I'm not sure. I tried to get out of the hole, and my legs were frozen into a block of ice, up just almost to the knees. And when I yelled for help because I couldn't stand up for that, my other soldiers in my unit came by with bayonets and started chopping the ice away from my legs to try and free me from this solid coating of ice in the bottom of the defile. And when they finally lifted me bodily out of the hole with ice still clinging to my legs, they would try to stand me up, and as soon as they did, I'd collapse and fall down. I could not stand up. And uh, they put me in an ambulance and took me away. Rocky Blunt is evacuated to a hospital a mile behind the American lines. There, doctors diagnose him with a condition known as trench foot. Caused by cold, unsanitary conditions, trench foot can impair the flow of blood to the feet. If untreated, the condition can lead to frostbite and, in a worst case scenario, amputation. I heard two doctors talking about amputating my feet. And I started crying like a baby, pleading with them, do not take my feet. I'm a musician, I'm a drummer. I need my feet, please don't take my feet. And this impassioned crying, they listened, they said, we'll give it another day or two and see if there's any improvement. And there was a little improvement apparently because they did not amputate, but they did keep me in the hospital until I could stand up. And then I was immediately returned to my unit. To this day, 65 years later, they haven't healed properly yet. next operation looks to be the most decisive of them all. The logical finish to what we started on Tarawa. And the whole damn Central Pacific campaign. At least this time, no one's promising a short battle. Combat correspondent Robert Sherrod is with Admiral Chester Nimitz's massive flotilla in the anchorage of Ulithi, an atoll in the Caroline Islands. For the past two years, Sherrod has been covering the Pacific War for Time and Life magazines, reporting from the front at Tarawa, Saipan, and Iwo Jima. Now, he's preparing for the invasion of Okinawa, the next campaign in the push toward Japan. Today, all us correspondents are on the Admiral's command ship to learn the details of Operation Iceberg. As expected, it's going to be the biggest thing we've attempted in the Pacific the last stop before Tokyo. Located only 350 miles south of Japan, Okinawa will provide the Americans with a staging area for the men and materials necessary to launch an invasion of the Japanese mainland. Defending the island are more than 100,000 Japanese and conscripted Okinawan soldiers. If they are to save their homeland from attack, 
they must stop the Americans from seizing Okinawa. Expecting intense resistance, the Americans have amassed a landing force larger than the one that assaulted Normandy on D-Day. Over 1,500 vessels carrying 183,000 American troops will converge on Okinawa. I've asked to tag along with the commanders of the 6th Marine 6th Division, the same guys I was with when we invaded Saipan. No matter how many times you're a part of a landing like this, you're never ready. This time, the stakes seem bigger, and so does the invasion force. But yet, somehow I still feel uneasy, as if we're not going in big enough. Nobody knows what the hell to make of it. The early reports are we've taken minimal casualties from isolated enemy snipers. Two killed, nine wounded. This is hard to believe. Landing with the commanding general of the 6th Marine Division hours after the first wave of invaders, Robert Sherrod arrives on Okinawa. It seems impossible that we've surprised them. But they must be here, somewhere. All around me is the carnage of smashed and burned tanks. I can't believe it, but it looks like we're beating the Germans in the Ardennes. Four days after being medically evacuated from the front lines in Belgium's Ardennes Forest, Rocky Blunt returns to the Army's 84th Infantry Division. While Blunt was recovering from a severe case of trench foot, the Americans launched a large counteroffensive against the Germans. Allied air power struck the German supply lines. American units pushed north, while British units pushed south. In early January, Hitler began to withdraw his forces. And by the end of the month, the engagement, nicknamed the Battle of the Bulge, is declared over. It is the largest and costliest battle ever fought by the U.S. Army, with more than 19,000 American soldiers killed and over 60,000 captured or wounded. Despite the considerable losses, the surviving American forces are reinvigorated by the resounding victory. The Allies are ready for the final push into German territory. There are no front lines anymore, no company or battalion boundaries, no safe or unsafe sectors. The Germans may be everywhere, but so are we. 
tide's turned. Now we are on the offensive. The Germans are on the run. It's so close. We can feel it. We can practically smell the end of the war. The first five days on Okinawa have been sensational. We've unloaded twice as many supplies as expected. Casualties are light too. 175 killed and less than 1,000 wounded. After reporting from the front lines during the first days of the Okinawa invasion, correspondent Robert Sherrod is on a ship anchored off the island. He's filing a story for Time magazine when the Japanese, who have been relatively silent, suddenly strike. In an attempt to strand the 180,000 troops ashore, the Japanese launch a vicious attack on the U.S. fleet, raining death from the skies. Although they had first hurled kamikazes at American warships months earlier, this time it's not just a few planes, but hundreds. They blew themselves up on Atu. They hurled themselves off cliffs on Saipan. Now the Japs have finally put their mania for suicide to effective use. Nobody but the Japanese could have combined such medieval religious fervor with a machine as modern as the airplane. For the next 48 hours, the Japanese launch nearly 900 aircraft. They sink 11 U.S. ships and damage another 22. Over the next six weeks, more than 2,000 Japanese planes will attack the American fleet. Nearly 5,000 U.S. sailors will be killed. Gasoline surrounds us. The war isn't over. Yet. The kamikaze has become Japan's most lethal weapon against our Navy. For once, I feel safer on land.
three days after barely surviving a kamikaze raid offshore, Robert Sherrod arrives back on Okinawa. While he was offshore, Army units began to push south toward the capital city of Naha, where they are encountering heavy resistance. To help support the battered GIs, Marines from the north are redeployed south. They are now approaching the main Japanese defensive position, known as the Shuri Line, extending across the southern end of the island, running from Naha on the west coast to Yanabaru on the east coast. The Shuri Line runs through the rocky ridges and hills below Shuri Castle. There. Heavily armed enemy defenders wait for the Americans to walk into their fields of fire. I have no desire to see any more shooting or get shot at. I've been following the Central Pacific campaign for so long that it sometimes feels like I've never written about anything except war. After almost three years of reporting from the front lines, Robert Sherrod decides his days in the combat zone are over. the nauseating smell of human carnage. If this isn't hell on earth, I don't know what else would be. G.I. Rocky Blunt has just entered a sub-camp of the Buchenwald concentration camp complex. Since ascending to power in 1933, Adolf Hitler has been systematically rounding up and exterminating Jews and minority groups he deems undesirable, such as homosexuals and the disabled. It was part of his master plan to create a true Aryan race. He called it the final solution. It's difficult to differentiate between the living and the dead. Only the haunting eyes can tell me if a skeleton is alive. Concentration the camps, camps are in a category all by themselves. By themselves. As far as atrocities, they were of such magnitude that it is beyond comprehension. It's more than the human mind can even conceive of. When you first come across it, you look, but you don't see. You listen, but you don't hear. You smell, but you don't know what you're smelling. We talk to them. In, in my very limited, very limited German, German, I say to them, we're Americans, we will save you. But they don't say anything. They don't yell, they don't cheer, 
they just stand there, silently. They're beyond making a noise. They're beyond having a voice. I meet a prisoner. I can hardly hear him when he talks. He tells me the German doctors at the camp conduct experiments on his throat, and he no longer has a voice box. I ask him what nationality he is. Ich bin ein Deutscher Jude, he says. I am a German Jew. He takes me to Das Crematorium and insists I go inside. Skulls, bones, and ashes are everywhere. Fingernails, which had been gouged out, are still stuck in the walls. He tells me, Vergessen Sie nicht. Don't forget. I couldn't, even if I wanted to. National Broadcasting Company humbly asks admission to your home in this, our hour of national sorrow. Crowds are lining Constitution Avenue from here to the White House. Many an American is standing with us today. All the soldiers and servicemen in the crowd stand firmly at attention. And now the caisson will start its solemn, sorrowful procession through Washington. On April 14, 1945, America bids farewell to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt the man who has led the country for the past 13 years. At a time like this, words are inadequate. The world knows it has lost a heroic champion of justice and freedom. In his infinite wisdom, Almighty God has seen fit to take from us a great man who loved and was beloved by all humanity. For the past four years, President Roosevelt steadfastly guided America through the war. During his presidency, the Allies have succeeded in containing the infectious spread of Hitler's armies and are now closing in on Berlin. In the Pacific, American forces have pushed the Japanese out of the Central Pacific and are now within striking distance of Tokyo. But there is still fierce fighting ahead, and now it is up to the inexperienced Harry S. Truman, Roosevelt's vice president for only 82 days, to lead the country to final victory. Tragic fate has thrust upon us grave responsibility. We must carry on. The destruction is part of our new life. As we head east, passing through towns leveled by our bombing campaigns, it looks as if all of Europe has been decimated.
GI Rocky Blunt and the 84th Infantry Division are pressing east at a fast pace. American forces are closing in on the town of Turgau at the Elbe River, where they are to meet up with the Soviet army, putting them one step closer to choking the Germans into submission. The National Broadcasting Company interrupts this program to bring you a special broadcast. President Truman has just announced that the Anglo-American and Russian armies have met in the heart of Nazi Germany. East and West have met. This is the news for which the whole Allied world has been waiting. Nazi Germany, tottering to her final collapse, has been split clean in half. The forces of liberation have joined hands. meeting of East and West is a triumph. But for some American soldiers like Rocky Blunt, the joy of the moment is short-lived. General Dwight Eisenhower decides to halt his troops at the Elbe River and focus on pummeling the Germans to the southwest. This means that Berlin, Germany's capital city, will be left for the Russians to take. Everyone I talk to is in shock and disbelief. Berlin has been our main goal for these past few months. And now we won't be going there. So many of our men had died on the way there. It seems strange I won't be setting foot in the German capital. As the Soviet army advances through the streets of Berlin, Reich's Chancellor Adolf Hitler marries his longtime mistress, Eva Braun. He waits until the Soviets are only blocks away and then shoots himself in the head. This is London calling. Here is a news flash. The German radio has just announced that Hitler is dead. Here's a special news bulletin. The British Broadcasting Company has just reported and Adolf Hitler died at the Reich Chancellery in the heart of burning Berlin. With Hitler gone and the capital of the Third Reich now a smoldering ruin, the men and women of the Allied forces, including G.I. Rocky Blunt, know that the end of the war is upon them. I guess I'll be heading home soon. After everything I've been through, that will be a major accomplishment by any account. But there's still so many unanswered questions, so much I'm uncertain of. One thing I am certain of, I have to put the horrors of the past behind me and build a new life, a life of peace, not war. This is the BBC Home Service. We're interrupting programs to make the following announcement. It is understood that in accordance with arrangements between the three great powers, an official announcement will be broadcast by the Prime Minister at three o'clock tomorrow. In view of this fact, tomorrow, Tuesday, will be treated as victory in Europe Day. After nearly six long years, the war in Europe is finally over. May 8, 1945, is declared Victory in Europe Day. Spontaneous celebrations erupt throughout the world. A very great crowd is collected already. Thousands upon thousands of people gathered to share this historic day with the King and Queen. Listen to the crowd.
The last communique of World War II is in. The Russian people were told for the first time of Germany's unconditional surrender. Our rejoicing is sobered and subdued by a supreme consciousness of the terrible price we have paid to rid the world of Hitler and his evil band. Let us not forget, my fellow American, our victory is but half won. The West is free, but the East is still in bondage to the treacherous tyranny of the Japanese. When the last Japanese division has surrendered unconditionally, then only will our fighting job be done. There's a lot of fighting, mainly thundering mortars, and it makes me feel on edge. First Sergeant Jack Werner is on Okinawa with the Army's 13th Combat Engineer Battalion. For the past five weeks, U.S. forces have struggled to advance toward the Shuri Line the primary Japanese defensive line of resistance. Along its rocky highlands, thousands of well-armed Japanese troops, concealed in caves and bunkers, are unleashing artillery concentrations unlike anything yet experienced in the Pacific War. We receive a communique that a Jap counterattack is beginning at any moment. They're close. We can feel it. Artillery and mortars are exploding around us. One of my men goes down, and then another. The situation is desperate. Werner and a dozen men in his platoon are wounded, all riddled with mortar fragments. I'm dazed, but I'm conscious enough to realize the damage that has been done to my men and to me. Everyone is wounded, and two of my men are gone. I'm incapacitated. I can't move. I can't get up from the litter. I can't do anything. While fighting near the Shuri line, Jack Werner was hit in the back and jaw by mortar fragments. It is May 8th, but the young Austrian Jewish immigrant has yet to hear the news of Germany's surrender. Eventually, the sailors arrive, and, and they carry, carry me to me a landing to a craft. Landing craft, and from the landing craft to the hospital ship Hope. When we arrived at the boat, there was nothing but white-clad soldiers and white-clad nurses and white-clad doctors and white, beautiful white linen bunks into which they dumped me after tearing off my 
dirty, blood-stained clothes. And this was the last I seen of Okinawa because soon thereafter I felt that we were moving and we were leaving. While Werner is evacuated back to the States, the battle on Okinawa continues for more than a month. By the end of May, American forces capture Shuri Castle. Weeks later, they overcome the Japanese in a vicious week-long battle on Kunishi Ridge. Days later, Okinawa is declared secure. With over 12,000 U.S. soldiers, sailors, and Marines killed or missing in action, and another 36,000 wounded, Okinawa is the bloodiest campaign of the Pacific War. And yet, the U.S. military still has plans to invade the Japanese home islands. There can be no peace in the world until the military power of Japan is destroyed with the same completeness as was the power of the European dictators. Codenamed Operation Downfall, the first phase of the invasion of Japan is planned for November. Estimates are that downfall will take over one year and involve five million Allied troops, with some casualty estimates as high as one million. After the staggering losses suffered on Okinawa, the White House fears that a war-weary American public may not be able to stomach the numbers. On July 26th, in the middle of a two-week conference in Germany, the Allies issue an ultimatum to the Japanese. Titled the Potsdam Declaration, it calls for Japan's unconditional surrender. But the Japanese reject the declaration. atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. We have used it in order to shorten the agony of war, in order to save the lives of thousands and thousands of young Americans. We shall continue to use it until we completely destroy Japan's power to make war. With Hiroshima in ruins, Truman warns the Japanese to surrender. He receives no response. Three days later, a second atomic bomb is dropped on Nagasaki. This footage of the blast was shot at 31,000 feet. The cities destroyed. 
but the Japanese are still unwilling to yield to the Allies. A third atomic strike is considered. From the Mutual Newsroom in New York, Tokyo Radio says acceptance of Potsdam Proclamation coming soon. One moment, please. This is not official. This is from the Tokyo Radio. Six days after America drops the second atomic bomb on Japan, the Japanese government notifies the Allies that it accepts the Potsdam Declaration on one condition, that the Imperial Emperor Hirohito retains sovereign status. Truman consents. President Harry Truman has announced the end of the, the war. The victory has been won. It's official from the White House. Japan to... surrenders. Japan surrenders. They will lay down their arms. There it is, the news you've been waiting for. It's over, all over. This is it. This is it, friends. The job has been done in the Western world and on the land and seas of the Orient. And let's not forget it. This is the NBC mobile unit in the heart center and the pulsing focus of a joyous nation on Times Square in New York City. And look uptown over a foaming, seething, writhing mass of faces lifted joyfully and buoyantly and gloriously happy at the final conclusion of a desperate war which has seen its closing days in a desperate day or three or four of anxiety, turmoil, anticipation, doubt, fear. Are these people happy? That's the only way to express it. Are you happy? This is undoubtedly one of the most incredible days of my life. At long last, I am home. After recuperating from his wounds, Jack Werner is in New York City. He has been discharged from the Army. Arriving at Pennsylvania Station, I am mobbed by everyone and anyone who comes through. It is a wonderful feeling, after everything we have been through. And here my reaction... My reaction was very emotional, I must say. I said it was a, a wonderful thing as it happened. It turned out to be, you know, EJ Day, and Times Square was exploding with people, and everybody was on the street, kissing and hugging each other. It was very, very nice. Three weeks after VJ Day, representatives of the Allied powers and Japan meet on board the battleship USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay to sign the formal instrument of surrender. Elements of this footage have not been seen before. Filmed by a sailor positioned in the ship's superstructure, General MacArthur and Admiral Nimitz walk toward history. My fellow countrymen, today the guns are silent. A great tragedy has ended. A great victory has been won. The skies no longer rain death. Men everywhere walk upright in the sunlight. The entire world lies quietly at peace. War is stupid. Crazy. We've got to have love on our planet. There is a pride in being a veteran. I know that being a veteran sets me apart from millions of other people who did not sacrifice so much of their life and their mentality and their emotions for our country. 
Of that, I'm very proud. What is the greatest generation? The greatest generation was everybody who worked hard to provide the means by which we were able to win this war. The greatness encompassed the country as well, the whole country. It's all of us, not just the military. The spirit of man has awakened. The soul of man has gone forth. Grant us the wisdom and the vision to comprehend the greatness of man's spirit that suffers and endures so hugely for a goal beyond his own brief span. We are all of us children of Earth. Grant us that simple knowledge. If our brothers are oppressed, then we are oppressed. If they hunger, we hunger. If their freedom is taken away, our freedom is not secure. Grant us a common faith that man shall know bread and peace, that he shall know justice and righteousness, freedom and security, an equal opportunity and an equal chance to do his best, not only in our own lands, but throughout the world. And in that faith, let us march, march toward the clean world our hands can make. Amen.